Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Center for Global Humanities. Uh, this is, as, you've, as, you've, as you know by now, this is an unusual year. We're not doing our lectures and presentations on site, on campus. We miss our audiences. We need shaking hands. We miss shaking hands and providing food and drinks. But also, uh, I'm glad also we have this technology to help us um, uh, carry on with our lecture series which is broadcast and streamed to our students in Biddeford, but also to our audiences in Maine and internationally. Uh, Rosanne Haggerty is a president and chief executive officer of Community Solutions. She is an internationally recognized leader in developing innovative strategies to end homelessness and strengthen communities. Community Solutions assists communities throughout the United States and internationally in solving the complex housing problems facing their most vulnerable residents. Their large-scale change initiatives include the 100,000 Homes and Built for Zero campaigns to end chronic and veteran homelessness, a neighborhood partnership that bring together local residents and institutions to change the condition that produce homelessness. Earlier, uh, she founded Common Ground Community, a pioneer in the design and development of supportive housing and research-based practices that end homelessness. Uh, Ms. Haggerty was a Japan Society Public Policy Fellow and is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, Ashoka Senior Fellow, Hunt Alternative Prime, Fund Prime Mover, and the recipient of honors including the Jane Jacobs Medal for New Ideas and Activism from the Rockefeller Foundation, Social Entrepreneur of the Year from the Schwab Foundation, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum's National Design Award, and Independent Sector's John W. Gardner's Leadership Award. She's a graduate of Amherst College and Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And joining us tonight, uh, I am uh, joining us tonight is Addie Smith uh, Ryman. She is the executive director of the Portland Society for Architecture. She is going to join us in the Q in the Q and A uh, sessions after the, after the lecture, so that can we will have a a good informed conversation about the issue of homelessness, especially as it pertains to the city of Portland. So now I leave you with our speaker, Roseanne Haggerty. Thank you, Anwar, and thank you, Addie. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I was uh, recalling earlier today when Addie and I first spoke, uh, she contacted me in December of last year. And it certainly seems like that was a world away. Uh, that conversation uh, was pre-pandemic and frankly everything has changed uh, including the context of homelessness and so as I get into my remarks uh, tonight uh, uh, the theme of public health and how a public health model even prior to the pandemic was emerging as the key set of insights to help communities actually drive to an end to homelessness rather than be in a place of just endless response and, and frankly despair and argument well, the pandemic has changed just about everything. And in this crisis environment, it certainly has been clear that a safe place to live is a matter of life or death. Not that we didn't always understand that, but it's it's not a case we have to make anymore. It's been the, the single thing that has enabled people to protect themselves from uh, the virus during these past months. Um, the economic crisis uh, has, has also attuned more of us than ever before to the the risks of people losing their homes right now we have economists predicting that homelessness uh, could increase by more than 40 percent over pre-pandemic levels so the, the the crisis has been crystallizing it's also been a source of enormous creativity uh, not something that i think many folks have reflected on but across the country we've seen communities step up and get more people into quarantine and isolation units, uh, get more people into housing in a short period of time because the life and death uh, essence of the situation was so clear. And I know that in the state of Maine, a number of well-being shelters were established and that the sense of urgency has, has actually animated uh, many new discussions in, in your community. But COVID-19 has also underscored the need for a different approach to homelessness and one that is guided by public health principles. And this is the approach that I'd like to share with you this evening 
because this is what's proving to be the key to actually reducing homelessness and in many communities now ending chronic and veteran homelessness and beginning to uh, reduce homelessness for entire populations in a number of communities who have adopted these principles. So I think 10 months ago, before uh, 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 even you know, the, the, the pandemic was on, you know, people's radar that, that uh, you know, we were beginning to hear of a disease spreading from China. Um, the, the idea that public health and public health concerns would become daily you know, uh, topics of conversation and expertise would have seemed far-fetched. But uh, successfully managing the pandemic, as we've seen other countries do it, and in certain states, uh, you know, uh, uh, the differential success in containing uh, the disease, all of the things that have gone into that uh, uh, experience that we can witness and, and, and uh, uh, monitor in certain states gives us a sense of how this set of ideas about collective action can actually make an enormous difference in homelessness. And I'll illustrate by walking you through what those communities that are part of our Built for Zero movement, uh, which is uh, a network of 80 cities and counties across the United States that are part of this collective effort to forge a path and really set the terms for the country in terms of showing that this is a solvable problem and that homelessness can yield to the same types of public health strategies that have, have um, actually conquered diseases that have changed and reduced traffic deaths that basically are uh, tools for managing complex problems. Uh, these uh, 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 initiatives and these principles are actually proving to be the keys to solving homelessness. We tend to, in, in this country, um, have a, a, a propensity to be answering the wrong question, I'd say. The, uh, 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 the Built for Zero communities uh, of the 80, more than half have reduced chronic or veteran homelessness, and 13 have reached a sustainable zero, which means that uh, no one is chronically homeless and that any veteran uh, becoming homeless is rapidly detected as, as needing assistance and is rehoused within 30 days. And that's a kind of a public health notion of, of uh, sort of staying ahead of a problem uh, and, and uh, defining an end state as a system knows how to Keep it to keep a problem solved, but at the essence of this effort is getting communities to begin with the right question. Debates over homelessness, we find generally, uh, and this was the case in all of these eighty communities that are now working toward a different goal. They, they tended to start with questions like, um, yeah, the, the debates were about what do we do about the encampments or where do we put the shelter. Uh, the, the places that are reducing homelessness are actually starting with a different question, which is how do we end homelessness in our community? And it would seem to be a harder question, but we found that it makes a diff the, the real difference between whether all of the earnest activity and, and real progress that uh, good programs and communities are making is uh, uh, actually leading to results or that in places where the debate is, is, is angry and frustrated, whether it can actually be converted to sort of a disciplined focus on a shared goal. So we, I'm gonna walk you through our own experience because this insight of the kind of problem that homelessness is and the kinds of responses that, that actually are effective, we learned the hard way through our own experience and, and actually starting in a very different place in our understanding of what, what the key activities needed to be. My colleagues and I spent 20 years building housing uh, and, and uh, we, uh, we, we kind of, you know, that was our, our sense of what clearly was uh, the, the, the answer to homelessness. And while it was an enormously important contribution to our community, and this was in the New York City area and, and surrounding, um, it was not getting us to anything like a reduction in homelessness in New York City. And we finally had this uh, kind of awakening that was our, our mission building and operating good programs or was it ending homelessness? What was the original intention? And that led us to actually yeah, start pondering the wisdom of that quote uh, attributed to Albert Einstein, that if you had an hour to solve a problem, spend 55 minutes of it you know, thinking about what the, the, the right question was. 
and uh, that the solutions would, would uh, begin to appear if you started with really analyzing what the, the na real nature of the program, uh, the problem was. And what we, we, we came to see was that our, our very good work represented in buildings like these, uh, just uh, we built about 3000 units of housing, were actually um, uh, uh, essential but insufficient parts of an answer to homelessness because we started with our view of a solution, which was let's build more housing uh, before really understanding the problem. And I'll, I'll um, kind of give you a sense of how uh, that, that reckoning and, and a set of new insights began coming about. So our buildings, as, you, as you're seeing, you can tell that they're you know, attractive and they have, uh, desirable, they make you know, great contributions to their community. We we're winning awards right and left. We were featured on 60 Minutes. We were you know, kind of seen as having the solution to homelessness. And, and to reinforce quality housing is absolutely key to ending homelessness. But we didn't have to look very far when we became kind of honest about it to realize that our, our solution was not actually reaching everyone who needed it. It wasn't sufficient. Every day we walked past men and women living on the streets surrounding our buildings. Um, and this didn't really fit this story that we had found the answer to homelessness if literally on our doorstep, people were remaining homeless. And for a long time, it, it was as though we, we like pretended that wasn't our problem. And I'm sorry to say that, well, you know, we had a solution. What was with these individuals who weren't getting housed? Well, we finally realized that this story that too many of us in the field were telling ourselves that there were certain individuals that didn't want help or were service resistant that that just made no sense at all. It was actually, you know, it was up to us to, to probe what was going on and to find you know, the, the, the information from people experiencing the problem about what would it take to actually get them the help they were seeking and needed. Um, and we started basically asking people, we interviewed over the course of uh, a, a, about a six month period, every single person who would speak to us who was living on the streets of Midtown in Man Manhattan. And, what we heard over and over again from individuals who, who had been homeless on the street for, in some cases, years, that they were regularly offered help with food or shelter or medical assistance, but were never offered help in finding what they were desperate for, a home. In fact, and then speaking with all of the organizations that were doing outreach and providing emergency services, we couldn't find a single story of anyone who'd have helped out of homelessness directly from the street into housing. You know, we had this elaborate system in New York that you had to be in the shelter and qualify and uh, wait your turn and uh, have all this documentation and be, you know, uh, kind of housing ready. And we began to see from just the, these conversations with individuals suffering from this, this a you know, completely avoidable, terrible situation that it was the, the rules and the, the lack of coordination or that, that had contributed um, to the persistence of the problem. And so what communities that are solving homelessness now are doing is not just asking the right question about what are we working on here? Are we working to solve the problem across the community? They're also designing with the user of the services, not, not for people who are experiencing homelessness. They're getting the, the insights they need about what isn't working directly from people who are trapped in the system. And I'll tell you a bit about how that looked. Um, as we had these deeper conversations with those experiencing homelessness and, and very you know, committed you know, staff at, at, at organizations, we we're realizing all of this confusion was, was and, and lack of progress in part could be attributed to the fact that it was no one's job to end homelessness in our city. Each organization had a program that they were focused on delivering and a contract that required them to do certain things. And they were earnestly guessing at what the a solution to a problem would be or that uh, uh, what might be um, uh, 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 needing a support, but none of it was coordinated. Even within organizations, you found you know, people not having the same story about what the priorities or the goals were with respect to their work on, on homelessness. The, the coordination between organizations was almost non-existent. Each program had its own rules and eligibility criteria and no organization 
had a sense of how homelessness was itself was unfolding in the city uh, or, or a sense that we actually had a higher responsibility uh, to solve homelessness across the city, not simply to operate our programs. And weird how that, that mindset can just take over that I'm responsible for what's in front of me, not for the whole. And so in these conversations with people experiencing homelessness and these folks at organizations really earnestly wrestling with why isn't our work adding up to something that is what we want, which is more progress, um, we just had a greater and greater sense, you know, that, that starting with the wrong problem really content, condemns you to being on the wrong path for a long time. And if you're, if you're, the problem you're solving is how do we run a program or deal with the encampment or open the shelter instead of how do we solve homelessness, then, then you, did, you do get stuck. And so we, we put these insights that it was the lack of coordination, the lack of a common goal, the lack of shared accountability to the test by bringing together in a whole series of, of meetings, first in New York, and then we, we brought this tool around the country. Um, we brought together individuals experiencing homelessness with representatives of all the agencies and organizations that uh, ourselves included, I should say, who had a role to play in assisting someone from homelessness to a home. And we asked the group to map out the required steps and how long on average it took to complete the process for a single individual to move from homelessness to a home. Well, this is what on average was happening. It was like mind boggling for these teams of people we uh, put together to actually try to see or explain the whole process because no one had the whole view of the problem. Uh, and you, you see, it was like this lethal game of shoots and ladders with stop, start, you know, uh, just confusion everywhere. And by asking people to, to figure this out together in a team, what people actually came up with pretty quickly, you know, uh, was like, it's virtually impossible for the system as designed to work for anyone. And people who were the most overwhelmed and had the largest challenges and, and facing uh, the, the, the greatest obstacles uh, to housing, they'd be the least likely to be able to thread their way through this, this complicated process, this maze that we had unknowingly created. And in city after city, um, putting these similar groups together yielded the same insights that um, no one had a comprehensive picture of what was happening to create homelessness or what was trapping people in homelessness or knew what programs were working or even how many individuals and families were experiencing homelessness at a given time. We'd all been working on a program level set of problems, not the key problem of how to end homelessness across a community. Well, so how does a community move in a new direction and organizes itself to solve a complex problem like homelessness to get out of this, this maze to actually be moving in a direction that is getting results. Well, that to me really turned to the public health playbook. And I'd say cities that are making very significant measurable progress are using what I'm gonna describe as the public health playbook. Because back when we saw this phenomenon and were as stumped as anyone about how to move forward, we started looking for examples of places where big complex problems had been solved, um, solved all the way through to a standard of every life matters and no failure is excusable, like comprehensive. And we found ourselves studying what is truly the thrilling story of how the world came together to end smallpox. So here's just a fascinating context for thinking about solving hard problems. A vaccine had been available for smallpox, a terrible disease. In the 20th century alone, it killed 300 million people. But the vaccine had been available for 186 years before smallpox was stamped out. And it was stamped out because of a bold global effort um, starting in 1959 and uh, smallpox was declared eradicated in, in 1980. And by 1959, most of the developed world had eliminated smallpox and there'd been surges of, of effort and uh, you know, different countries had eradicated it. But in, in many of the most vulnerable and poorest parts of the globe, it persisted. And despite the fact that there was a vaccine 
And what the strategy was that the World Health Community finally you know, learned and developed um, was that mass immunization was a strategy that maybe worked in the global north, but in a very dispersed population, very um, uh, hard to reach uh, uh, villages throughout uh, uh, India and parts of Africa, that um, you needed a different technique and a, a, a strategy called uh, surveillance and containment, like actually follow the actual path of the disease to the person level and interrupt it there, ended up being the key insight. And that that enabled like a new way of working and a, a, a new um, uh, kind of burst of energy and confidence that this disease could actually be eradicated. But what was also characteristic of, of this new strategy and this global effort was an appreciation of the need for coordination on an unprecedented scale and an extraordinary focus on uh, data, like what's actually happening in real time and on building collaborative structures that, that just keep going at the problem. You know, like, teams that involve everyone from the international health organization down to the local health workers, gathering, using the same information and iterating and learning their way into what needs to happen next based on what's actually emerging and changing on the ground. And I'm fond of showing this slide actually when, when, when people ask me what the communities that are getting to zero homelessness look like? What's their command structure? What does the, their collaboration look like? I show them this slide, which happens to be of the team working in Nigeria. Now this was, uh, I think about a year and a half ago, this slide, uh, the photograph was taken, working in Nigeria to get, on, get to the last mile on eradicating polio there. Uh, a built for zero community team would kind of look the same in that the essence is, Everyone who has a key role to play is around the same table. They're looking at the same information and they're talking through what needs to happen next and coordinating their efforts. And, and interestingly, I mentioned that this was about ending polio in Nigeria. Almost every major effort to get to zero on anything harmful has, has taken its lessons from the smallpox eradication campaign, whether it's ending polio or uh, immunizing uh, children throughout the uh, uh, global south, or even curbing traffic deaths, the Vision Zero movement to eliminate traffic fatalities and in injuries. It's also taking, it's, it's got the same DNA as the smallpox eradication campaign. So we feel as though we're in good company and adapting these techniques to homelessness. And we're seeing it play out in reduced homelessness in these 80 communities. Um, the, the next thing that communities that are making real progress uh, towards zero are doing is that they're learning by doing. Uh, they don't have all the answers when they start out, but they have that shared goal and they have the team assembled that is committed and accountable to each other to reaching it and, and just learning their way into what works. And the, the first um, application of this idea of learning by doing um, was uh, in, in our case, once we uh, started following the path of, of this collaborative problem solving using a public health model, was um, the 100,000 Homes campaign. Now, um, Portland participated in this effort, which was a, a pretty amazing learning experience for us all. It uh, went from 2010 to 2014. And what we did was uh, uh, sort of invited communities around the country to um, join forces in a collective effort to house 100, thousand of the most medically vulnerable, chronically homeless individuals across the country in a four-year period, and basically learn how to improve our housing placement process. Uh, we saw that no one was tracking housing placements and that housing placements, you know, the end state for, for individuals would be a very good place to start to learn, like, is this what we do need to do more of? Just improve that process in order to uh, uh, substantially reduce homelessness. And in the course of the four years, uh, just a, a, from a, a point of view of, of um, 
uh, uh, people learning and sharing in a critical process and hitting our goals, it was enormously successful. More than 105,000 uh, vulnerable people were housed. Uh, many, I mean, the average length of homelessness uh, was I think eight years. Many people had been homeless for 30 years or more and people at communities had, had sort of written off as no way can this person be helped. And so amazing though that was that this collective muscle had shown that focusing on a new task and learning how to do that together could lead to an amazingly you know, positive results. That said, no one community had gotten close to ending homelessness. And we, my, my colleagues and I stepped back and you know, kind of reflected uh, for about a six month period after the end of the 100,000 Homes campaign and, and realized that yeah, maybe we asked, we didn't ask the right question. You know, housing more people was absolutely critical and uh, you know, the, the life-changing benefit of, of that for those who were um, uh, reached. But um, it occurred to us that actually we needed to start with the end state in mind uh, and the idea of like, what would it take to help communities to get to zero? Not simply to count up to a larger housing placement goal, but to count down to no one experiencing homelessness for any kind of a long period of time that you know, most homelessness would be prevented. And if it happened, if a housing crisis happened, that a community would be set up to resolve it quickly. So it would never become a persistent or lasting uh, 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 situation for an individual. And so that was the beginning of our thinking and certainly learning in public about what would it take to mobilize a movement around counting down to zero. And so Built for Zero was launched in January, 2015. And uh, we put the word out to communities about who would like to be part of this learning process. We don't know exactly how to do it, but we know it's the right task to figure out collectively what it takes to actually eliminate homelessness in the community. And uh, we had learned in the 100,000 Homes campaign an awful lot about uh, from the communities that were making the most progress about how they had organized their local team to be uh, super effective. And we saw that the most effective communities had at least four key people at the table or institutions. One was the continuum of care, two was the, the mayor or the county executive's office, three was the housing authority, and four was the local Veterans Affairs Medical Center because uh, they were managing their resources for, for veterans experiencing homelessness. And so we, we said to communities, if you're willing to get those four entities to sign on together a memorandum of agreement that they're gonna to work together toward the shared goal of getting to zero, that they're willing to collect the data we collectively realize is gonna be needed to show what's working and to help everyone learn, to participate in a learning community, uh, to um, just, yeah, just have each other's backs as we figure this out. And we had, um, uh, uh, 72 communities actually sign on. And so uh, in the last five years, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the critical learning has include realizing that quality data is, is, is king. Um, we, uh, we started, and, and those of you working in the homeless sector in Portland will be familiar with the point in time count. So we started with that data that every community collects. It's an estimate that collects and reports uh, uh, in January for, and you know, is, is uh, shared with HUD and you know, that, that this becomes what is the, at least the perceived um, uh, uh, number of people experiencing homelessness in a community. But what um, we found in using that pit count data is that communities were wildly off as they, they, they projected how many people they needed to get to zero. And you know, months later, a year later, you know, they were housing lots of people and then the needle wasn't moving. And so it was this kind of collective sense that you know, the, the reason communities weren't making more progress was that we didn't really have anywhere a clear handle on how many people were actually homeless. We had that annual estimate and it was better or worse quality uh, as you move from community to community. And so we came to the collective conclusion that we needed to have in every community, the ability to know 
to the person level in real time who is actually experiencing homelessness in order to uh, know what was working, what was um, uh, 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 actually where where people were not being accounted for, uh, that uh, if the number was fluctuating all over the place, that was uh, not necessarily an indication that fewer people were homeless. It could just as easily mean that you know collectively that the community didn't really know how many people were experiencing the problem. And so gradually, and now we're up to 72 of our 80 communities have by name real time data. And uh, this actually is at the heart of when communities started to see dramatic reductions and to be able to follow like what interventions were working to help the most people get housed. And uh, this, this sense of like, once we had the right information and communities were organized in the right way, we could see and now can say with some real confidence that um, there are five ingredients to an effective community structure to end homelessness. And it's not what we used to think were the, the keys to ending homelessness, you know, enough programs or more housing. That's part of it, but it's inadequate. The biggest thing that's leading communities to superior results is that shared measurable aim. Are they working to end homelessness? Or is everybody on the same team? Uh, is the, the community's progress actually at the center of everyone's focus as opposed to what individual programs are doing? So that's number one. Number two is having that team. We tend to call it a command center, but it's having those key organizations that are part of the COC, the, the uh, local government, the VA, and the housing authority. And, and many communities bolt on other important and, and uh, groups, whether it's landlord associations, faith-based groups, uh, but uh, they're uh, having that team that is cross-agency and working to solve a problem for a community, not simply in the interests of their own organization's work is key. Next, it's that data I spoke about. Having that by name real time feedback loop so you know what the heck is going on every day. Like, are we making progress or are we sliding back? What's working, what isn't? And then this flexible arsenal of resources is where services, uh, money, housing comes in. You, you need what people experiencing homelessness need in order to solve the problem. And, and the more flexibility, the better. You know, uh, uh, communities that have been able to free up kind of rules and, 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 and you know, access to housing that isn't so constrained by you know, rigid eligibility criteria are finding how important that is to actually solve the problem in front of them rather than, than simply have you know, resources available that don't match the specific problem that they're facing for individuals or as a community at a given moment in time. And then lastly, and this has been part of the, the, the work of Built for Zero, it's helpful to have what we call like a testable menu of, of strategies. Basically, what are other communities doing on this problem that I could learn from? To basically accelerate learning by having many case studies of how other communities have tackled some of the problems that are quite common in the field, whether it's getting more landlords on board or kind of dealing with getting programs to operate more flexibly, um, uh, th those, those types of challenges. And part of the, the kind of the, I don't know, the, the making the engine turn in this, this new system, which is around the team, around a shared goal, is having the right information to tell you how a dynamic problem like homelessness is actually moving and changing every day. So that uh, teams aren't solving like last January's problem based on the estimated data. They're, they're, they know what's going on this week, this month. And um, what is, is powerful is, and, and you know, imagine almost um, like a checkbook. Yeah, every month the community can account for everyone. Uh, they uh, are, are looking at these six key data points uh, based on the, the by name real time information that they have. And I should say that is collected with a HIPAA compliant release that is shared appropriately, you know, only by those uh, uh, organizations and, and workers who need to know specific information. Otherwise a community can look at a dashboard of, dis of, of, of uh, de-identified information. But uh, in each of these built for zero communities, 
they're looking constantly at who is actively homeless, who, who, who is right in front of us. But they're also tearing that number apart to see who is new this month or this week that we have never seen in, in our system before and what happened. They can ask questions of those individuals and families to find out what broke down that caused them to become homeless. That's critical learning for preventing homelessness. They're also able to see who's returned to homelessness, who, who had been helped with housing or with some type of intervention, because that's a different kind of problem. It was like the, the wrong fit or not enough of the, the support. And then there's also um, uh, examination every, every time the team meets, uh, which generally is, is a couple times a week, um, is like who came back into our system that had just gone off the radar. Because in many cases, we think that maybe a problem has been resolved because we don't see the individual anymore, um, or that we're holding a resource, like we're, oh, that person's on the waiting list, but we haven't seen um, uh, that, that individual, and we're, you know, we, we don't know what's happened, and you know, just kind of things stall out. Well, on the outflow side, every month, every week, the community is looking at how many people did we actually help with a housing resource, and how many people do we just not see in our system anymore? Um, because people are resolving their own homelessness all the time. And in fact, that's the most common way people escape homelessness. But we've never actually you know, been able to account for that before. And having this ability to see like what's actually happening across the whole community is the most powerful tool that we've yet found for helping communities actually know what's working, know what they need to do next, and have a shared sense of what, what's to be done. Uh, and this is also very, very common, this way of working, this way of thinking in, in um, the world of, of pick that public health challenge. You just need to know who's affected and how your interventions are playing out, what's working, what isn't, who's affected, and what needs to happen next. So another feature of the communities that are getting to zero is that they're using all their assets. Uh, one of the things that's been fascinating to study, uh, and uh, we observe it all over the country now in these communities, is that having an accurate living local picture of homelessness actually kind of changes the, um, uh, the energy in a community. It, it goes, it takes the issue from being very abstract and overwhelming and you know, like what's to be done to, we know we really have our arms around this problem. It may be big, it may be very hard to figure, figure out how we're gonna get there, but we actually understand what we're dealing with. And that has unlocked so much creativity and energy around seeing assets that a community had never even thought of as having meaning for ending homelessness. Um, Having, having this you know, really clear information, first of all, helps communities uh, um, use, you know, use all their subsidy dollars and you know, the, the affordable housing units that they, they uh, control in, 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 in the most, um, that match them in the most effective way. Uh, like, for example, here's a, a, a person who's a senior who's also experiencing homelessness can we draw on our senior housing resources? Or here's someone who um, uh, uh, actually uh, all he or she needs is um, a short-term subsidy. And you know, before when people were, were not understood in you know, this differentiated way, you know, they'd be waiting for a long time uh, for something that was, was possibly not what they, uh, they needed to escape homelessness. Um, but um, excitingly on the housing front itself, Having this really clear information, we've seen uh, communities be able to move resources within their housing authorities, within state housing agencies. We've seen them be able to uh, 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 mobilize social impact investment from local foundations or high net worth individuals to uh, start acquiring housing to fit specific gaps. And, and to you know, do so with confidence because they know specifically the, the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, you know, th this data will help communities know what part of their problem is about coordination and what part of it is, is actually uh, linked to finding new housing supply. And just to give you an example, 
of the, the kind of creativity I'm, I'm talking about. Here's a, an apartment building in uh, just outside Denver, Colorado, near the relatively new Veterans Affairs Medical Campus. Now, um, Metro Denver has been part of Built for Zero um, since the beginning. And they were down to about 350 uh, veterans still experiencing homelessness. And what they saw was they had enough subsidy dollars and case management resources through the VA, through the, um, the VASH program. For those of you who are you know, working in homelessness services, it's a supportive housing rental voucher plus case management. They had enough of those resources for every one of those 350 veterans. But what they didn't have were enough landlords in the Denver area willing to accept the voucher. And so the, the group there uh, and, and the, the command center team in Denver is like, well, maybe we could buy some buildings and, and you know, just actually start moving more property into not-for-profit ownership to be available uh, when there was natural turnover for homeless veterans. So the idea like, let's become the landlord. Well, it took about 120 days, but we worked with uh, a family office in Denver, uh, a group of investors who uh, were interested in veterans issues and uh, we're able to acquire this building and we're working on another uh, to bring it into not-for-profit ownership to uh, uh, actually pledge all of the units as they turn over to veterans who are coming from homelessness. Um, it, uh, for any of you who've been involved in, in building housing using tax credits, it's almost miraculous to actually complete a housing project and have people move in within 120 days but uh, uh, this is an example of just you know a, a, an apartment building coming on the market in, in a, a tight housing market, using local assets, local investors uh, to actually acquire it and become a new affordable housing resource. Uh, now there are 44 formerly homeless veterans living in the building, a uh, total of 66 units. The, the other units are, are workforce housing. But um, the, the, the creativity certainly doesn't end there once you have the right data and will and an organized team. Um, here's a, a project that will probably close on uh, December 1st. We're working with the city of Santa Fe who had the idea that maybe they could use some of their CARES dollars from the Stimulus Act uh, to not simply um, uh, respond to the immediate emergency of getting people experiencing homelessness into safe quarantine and isolation uh, uh, settings, maybe they could just buy an asset, use, use the CARES dollars to add to their affordable housing supply in Santa Fe. And this is um, uh, an extended stay motel complex in very good condition, 124 units. And uh, the owner was desperate, you know, the hospitality industry has suffered. And so it's a complete win-win. The city is acquiring uh, with a, a local not-for-profit that will be the owner operator, um, uh, 124 units of housing that is you know, uh, day one uh, because it has kitchenettes and, and is set up for uh, extended stay purposes. You know, it, it becomes a part of their uh, 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 badly needed um, uh, uh, portfolio of affordable housing. They'll, they'll, they'll probably reduce chronic homelessness in, uh, by half in one fell swoop with this kind of creativity because they've got their data and they were nimble and focused on, on a common goal. But uh, around the country and in some of the conversations we're having that I just find more and more um, compelling because of this creativity um, uh, being uh, unleashed once teams are organized, they have the right goal, they're solving the right problem, they, they have the right data, is they get better ideas like uh, uh, accessory dwelling units. I'm not sure what the story is in, in Maine, but one of the things about you know, the, the hand wringing is, oh, where are we gonna find land? Well, lots of people have plenty of land in their backyard. And in you know, uh, now uh, uh, the states of Washington and Oregon, where we do a lot of work, California, even New Hampshire, uh, 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 Utah, they're all like, why aren't we encouraging the construction of these modest uh, accessory dwelling units to essentially make better use of an asset, which is like people's capacity on their own properties to, uh, to add uh, an additional unit. Uh, and then uh, I'm, I'm taken with, like, I probably getting like a, a two calls a month at least 
about what are we going to do about the mall that's closed? What about all this commercial office space that's coming on the market? Having, um, having your data, having your team, knowing the goal you're trying to accomplish actually changes the conversation about how you look at your community in that underutilized building, that mall that shut down, that uh, office that's never gonna reopen. All of a sudden it's just like, how could that plug into our solution? Because our community is on a mission to get this job done. And uh, uh, it's uh, 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 this, this uh, uh, unleashing of innovation really is a product of having an organized community with the right goal and the right information. And then I'll say one of the other characteristics of cities that are getting the job done is that they've just internalized this idea that you have to move from thinking about programs and you know we, we need good programs in every community, but good programs do not add up to reduced homelessness. Yeah, like we, we weren't getting there. And I'm speaking as like a complete, you know, kind of convert to the cause. I, I spent years running good programs and we weren't getting to an end to homelessness in our community. And it wasn't until we started working with people across our communities for that common goal of doing whatever we needed to do, all of us in to reduce homelessness and adjust our intake policies, our eligibility standards, whether we, you know, try to, qualified people into shelter or tried like mad to prevent people from having to come into shelter. You know, that, that shift of practice, of thinking from the program to the community is really, you know, when a, commu when a community gets there, they, they, they see this issue change. And uh, uh, this happens to be, um, I think Bakersfield, California, I'm showing uh, uh, a slide of, and uh, we, we've been working, I should say, for a couple of years with uh, Tableau Foundation, which is the uh, data analytics uh, uh, company. They've uh, been incredibly generous to us you know, in, in providing licenses for all of our communities to actually know how to use um, this kind of, of, of data visualization software to basically translate what's going on and that shift from program to system so that you know, communities like pre-COVID were like having meetings in the library once a month to show the community like where they were on the journey. And so, you know, there's something really powerful about having everyone look at the same information in the same way. And so you see you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the other benefit of, of this kind of data, and I'm not gonna, you know, take you through lots of different slides to show you how it's, it's used, but, you know, Bakersfield, the whole Bakersfield team could be like, okay, what happened between you know, April and May that you know, we had 12 new people become chronically homeless? And so the team can be like, how do you unpack that particular problem and shift, you know, test some ideas about what will actually change that situation? And uh, so we, we, we train communities in the use of these data collection uh, uh, techniques. We train communities in the use of um, this data visualization software so that everyone can see what's happening and, 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 and uh, have different conversations about you know, whether things are moving in the right, right direction. But we also train communities in the use of quality improvement as, as, a, as a critical skill in learning your way forward in anything that is, is um, sort of a stuck situation. Uh, so the way this works is quality improvement is, is a way of, of essentially hypothesizing, well, what if we did this? How would we know it's a, a, a positive change? What could we measure? And, and having a whole group just be in a constant series of experiments as opposed to arguing my approach versus your approach. It's just like, let's put it to the test and let's see how we can measure it. And it's also so important in this moment um, uh, that uh, the, the training that we've provided communities and design thinking comes into play. Because this is where you really have to go back, as I said earlier, to the, 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 those experiencing homelessness and say like, how is this working for you? We think this is the, the reality. Is that actually your experience? What would change look like for you? And so there's enormous participation in this data quality improvement process of those experiencing homelessness to actually inform what's what's stuck, what's broken, and what a, a test of something better could look like. And so you this 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 chart kind of gives you a sense of a community learning its way forward, experiment after experiment, you know, 
testing you know, one approach after another, solving one problem after another. And uh, there's, you know, it's also just an admission that there's no silver bullet here. This is hard work, but coordinated work where everyone sees where the picture is moving is the way this problem is getting solved, just like these other global health problems have been uh, advanced and, and, and uh, are in, in the case of smallpox solved, but in many other cases, you just see steady progress. And so my last slide here is the other thing that characterizes these communities is that they're committed to results. You know, that, that they're like, they're going back to the drawing board to get to that result of zero homelessness. And so um, we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 13 communities that have ended chronic uh, or veteran homelessness or most, uh, or, or, or both actually. And uh, um, yeah, most of them are well on their way to ending youth homelessness or, or uh, ending uh, homelessness for all single adults. Um, we're probably gonna have our first community that's just ended homelessness for everyone uh, within the next um, probably seven months. Uh, and uh, while it's vital that we all keep track of how many individual lives have been changed, and it's more than 125,000 at this point um, that, that have been housed through these by these communities through this process. What is equally important is that these the communities are building systems that are gonna last for the long-term and prevent people from becoming homeless. And that it's not simply a matter of counting up anymore. It's about building community capacity to solve a problem like homelessness that requires Rig, you know, rigorous collaboration and a shared goal. Um, so I, I will pause there. I've, I've got more to say about maybe what this could mean for Portland and what Community Solutions Next Chapter looks like. But I know Addie has some questions and maybe we can start with some back and forth now. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you. Rosen. Yeah, I mean, I have, before I, uh, before I uh, turn you to uh, invite uh, Addy to ask you a few questions. I have a couple of questions myself, which are of a general nature, not not specific to to the issue. But I was a little during the pandemic. I was kind of interested in the fact that a lot of people were losing, were lost the ability to pay their mortgages, mm -hmm. and uh, and there was a new policy that was instituted, part of the um, CARES Act or part of the uh, support or the stimulus package that the government gave was was to impose some kind of forbearance and, uh, and the banks would somehow mm. uh, give the homeowners some sort of uh, uh, time to recover and, and before they can. So what I was wondering is, as you were talking about homelessness and recently having read a little bit about what's happening in California as a whole, um, I mean, the question of how does one become homeless besides the fact that they may have some mental illness or some other kind of condition, I mean, it seems to me that people are always on the verge, or millions of people are on the verge of being homeless. So how can we bring homelessness to zero, reduce homelessness to zero, if, if the, potential, uh, the potential of becoming homeless in the United States uh, is always like, it's always there? Mm -hmm. Well, Anwar, I'd say that, you know, you, you've pointed to something that is um, a vital piece of all of this is that, yeah, people are amazing problem solvers and often need like our, our, our systems and our rules to actually get out of the way so that they can, you know, kind of manage their, their housing needs on their own. It is entirely, you know, in, in, in many parts of the country, um, uh, 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 an, an incredibly punishing thing, the, the cost of housing. But what we see over and over again is that if you focus just on homelessness, it actually tells you a lot about the housing policies you need, that you need to start somewhere. Otherwise, you're kind of where the country's been for too long, just like throwing its hands in the air. Like, but if you start understanding how all of these housing policies actually interact or fail to interact, through the lens of homelessness, you can begin to see where to put your investments and where to change your, your local zoning policies or your housing subsidy policies. You've got to start somewhere. And this has been a powerful way to help communities start thinking about like what, what are all the risks that go into people becoming homeless 
and how can we fix them? Mm -hmm. So the one more question before I turn it to Addie. The, so the question of homelessness is not necessarily related to income because I, I, read, I read about the cases of people who have full-time jobs, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, yeah. uh, in, in big cities in Southern California, uh -huh. especially, yeah. but also, uh, and, that, and they're homeless. Mm -hmm. So, um, and how, what do you do about those people? Yeah. Oh yeah, again, uh, you're giving me all these softballs here, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but I'll tell you, you know, like I, I'll just give you some facts, and you'll see yeah. just how messed up this is. Um, like in New York City, for example, uh, the city is spending now three point two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. This is before you know uh, additional you know, COVID related costs. Three point two billion dollars on its shelter system. Uh, it, it, it was it basically like something like $73,000 on average for a family by the time they finally got out of the shelter system. For a fraction of that, if you'd subsidized that family's rent, they would have been on their own. Right. And so what we have learned is that bad policies create homelessness. Good policies can fix it. This is, this, you know, it's not an inevitable problem, but when you actually follow what you know, you know, families and individuals experience, and it's often for want of like the right flexible help information, a coordinated system at the right time, that they end up in this complete spiral. And it just becomes you know, more traumatic, more difficult, you know, more costly. And so this is where if, you know, if our policies are informed by what is real, like a community working on solving a problem with the right information, everybody on the same page, that's what's really at the end of the day different about these communities. They agree on the policies they need because they see the real problem. They're not like theorizing like, oh, if we did this or we did that, they actually are looking at what's broken and fixing that. Interesting. Addie? Yeah. Great. So um, thank you, Roseanne. This is fabulous. And, and I'd be remiss in not identifying um, a local architect, Liz Newman, who is the one who introduced us. Um, Liz was an architect for you in New York, and we had a great conversation about what, you know, really design for um, integrity really is, you know, and so, but going back to this larger, almost wicked problem, um, mm -hmm. I'm really curious when you show those photos of working on vaccine and sort of dealing with this world health issue, um, who in your cities where you're seeing the most success has the diversity of, you know, architects, um, spatial planners, um, as well as public health officials and other agencies? Like who is sitting at the table and is there enough mm -hmm. in thinking again about spatial allocation and design and um, and how does that fit into this? Very good question, Addie. I would say that um, these these eighty communities plus there's a, a new group of them starting with us this fall. Uh, it's it's typically people either in government who may or may not have a planner background, um, and uh, people at uh, the continuum of care who have basically come to a realization that what they're doing isn't working, that it is a wicked problem and needs a different kind of, of um, solution, and that they're, they're open and listening. It's not that they're coming with their expertise necessarily. They're like, what we're doing isn't working, and um, that they have learned about or kind of been at a, yeah, or knew someone from another city or another mayor or something who said like, you know, like, this is, this is, like the only thing that's actually ever worked to drive the numbers down. And so it's often not people who are in public health who are finding us, but it's people who are experiencing the problem either at the COC or the mayor or county executive's office. And they're just like, there's got to be a better way. That said, one of the things that we had started to do prior to the pandemic and has just accelerated because of it is to try to connect with public health agencies and the CDC and healthcare systems. We'd had these, you know, kind of growing conversations and, you know, that, uh, that were always full of curiosity and kind of like, yeah, no, we, we know that we have something to do with homelessness, but, you know, our plates are full or, 
Well, the the pandemic has just accelerated all of these conversations. We're in weekly conversation with the CDC. We're, we're you know, the, the, the idea that um, they should have a role in this issue, that they should be training and supporting public health agencies. And I think one of the things in the past that we found was, was challenging when communities that were part of Built for Zero would reach out to the public health agencies and we'd encourage that. We, I think we all had some forewarning that you know, like they are hollowed out, you know, like most of these public health agencies didn't have a person to send to the continuum of care meeting. Well, we think that one of the byproducts of the of, of COVID will be just this recognition that we need to invest in our public health infrastructure in the country. Um, and there's actually now money allocated uh, by Congress for a public health data modernization initiative. And one of our goals is like designing homelessness out of existence have the CDC monitor this issue the way they do you know, measles, the way they do you know, uh, uh, um, uh, workplace injuries. Uh, but the, I think the next frontier actually will be, um, and we, we just see in a few cities that are, are actually kind of at zero, they are asking these questions about how do we organize our housing systems? How do we think about you know, the, kind of the spatial components of, of what's producing homelessness? We have a few um, communities. Hartford, Connecticut is, is, is one. Rockford, Illinois is another that are, are sort of in the vanguard there. And just really looking at how does like zoning, eviction policies, mm -hmm. um, you know, housing management standards, uh, like where we locate our housing, how does this all play into, you know, what people's opportunities to live safely in uh, appropriate housing? So the city right now is actually going through um, the rewrite of their code. Mm -hmm. And there are countless conversations about more housing density. Um, and you know that brings up a lot of emotion around neighborhood character. Um, PSA has been involved for a while with whether it's through design competitions or mapping of thinking about neighborhood nodes in the quarter mile neighborhood or neighborhood mm -hmm. centers. Uh, the Paris mayor is doing the 15 city, mm -hmm. um, uh, the 15 minute city. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes that doesn't actually include everyone. You know, you sort of, it's a 15 minute city for whom? For someone that can mm -hmm. afford to live there. Mm -hmm. So looking at that policy in a variety of tiers of housing a diverse population um, with a variety of economic factors mm -hmm. isn't, that's another wicked problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to look at this from the perspective of the zero movement at every economic bracket Mm -hmm. So you do have a diverse community of a variety of needs. And I, mm -hmm. I think that that is really one of the hardest struggles that every city goes through. Mm -hmm. um, housing advocates will fight for more and more density. And then um, their opposition will say, well, more and more density will actually create more market rate apartments, which will further squeeze people out. So there's a, you know, a mm -hmm. really difficult balance here. Um, ironically, right now, um, ADUs are literally on the docket for city council. Um, mm -hmm. So they are concurrent having this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a question and fear around this. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of perception that I think we keep chasing around. And I, I love your idea of asking, we're asking the wrong question. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can maybe tease out or even mm -hmm. share what are some of the questions we can start asking so we can almost jump this hurdle? Mm -hmm. um, I've actually thought a lot about this. So I think that communities need to understand housing as a system, not as mm -hmm. a bunch of independent parts. Um, and that uh, we therefore, like, we need to be thinking what is the goal of our system? And I think there are three worthy goals that really we need to, yeah, like just about anyone would agree to uh, uh, that uh, A, uh, there's no homelessness, uh, B, that no one's paying a, 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 an unbearable percentage of their income and rent, maybe more than 40%, and that uh, housing should be safe, um, you know, sh shouldn't, shouldn't hurt us. Um, and that we should be, 
we should be actually designing our policies. Do we need to change zoning? Do we need to have, you know, uh, uh, you know, different types of, of building codes or that are, are, are more flexible and don't tie, you know, the process up? Do we need to have a different um, uh, 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 tax policy? All of those decisions really should serve what is going to house all of our people. So there's no homelessness. No one is rent burdened to a degree that they, you know, their their health and you know their 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 um, uh, uh, other areas of of of, of family and, and individual you know well being are threatened, and you know, it should be structurally sound, and 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 not like harmful to your health. Mm -hmm. And if we could simplify it, it's a really different set of questions around like you know what what um, what do we have to do to produce that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for, for the PSA, what we're looking at now is a design competition. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is always something to prompt people to think, um, beyond and, you know, we've had some success in the last couple of years with, uh, two design competitions where we really didn't think much would be yielded except the ideology and the discussion around, um, you know, mm -hmm. big thinking big, um, but we're seeing some inspiration from that actually filter into real life. Great. So this, again, this, we're right now um, asking those, but we don't know if we're asking the right questions. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm inviting actually both Anwar and, and you, Roseanne, to, you know, you've already given us some fodder, but to really ask the right questions, um, mm -hmm. to think bigger. And also in this COVID, we're not post COVID yet, Mm -hmm. Clearly, mm -hmm. um, how are we reimagining our office buildings and our office parks, and mm -hmm. what is that potential? Um, Maine has an aging workforce. Uh, we don't have the millennials that are clawing to get back to the office culture because they're not living in their parents' basement. Um, they, many of the workforce is actually uh, really comfortable working from home, um, and so we have a large a large portion of commercial real estate that could potentially even temporarily be repurposed. So how do we build our buildings? Are we building mm -hmm. our buildings so that they evolve and ebb and flow with the mm -hmm. needs of our time? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's an area that we're, we're very curious about. That sounds exciting. And it sounds on point with um, this idea of like uh, communities needs change and having a dynamic planning process and even dynamic buildings like live workspace clearly now is is something that you know, more of us are appreciating and will be seeking um, and uh, you know what what um, what types of um, co-locations could make it easier for you know families seniors you know who's actually in your population to have the de decent housing options Anwar do you have okay. a question no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely enjoying this conversation as you two are having, you know, it's just, uh, you know, uh, I do have, I mean, my questions are of a different nature. I'm just enjoying the conversation. But I, yeah. with the question, I do, you, you mentioned something about this interesting situation. I never thought of it before. It's very fascinating to the, uh, the, uh, uh, these, the population of Maine would rather be at home than in the office because of the age and everything else. But being at home now because of the COVID-19, it's like, homelessness, maybe home boundedness or something, it's causing its own stresses on yeah, people. Absolutely. So people know mm -hmm. there's a fantasy, there's a desire to walk, get out of the house, go somewhere mm -hmm. else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so it's an interesting relationship to the home right now, you know, with a, because yeah. of COVID-19. And right. But, but uh, Rosanna, I have this question. You said, you know, we're going to design uh, homelessness out of mm -hmm. existence. That's a fascinating mm -hmm statement mm -hmm. there but mm -hmm. and i'm not so sure i'm convinced of the metaphor of the eradication of the measles of the smallpox mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the use of the vaccine because that's that's a one-time thing a vaccine is a more of a mm -hmm. biological process and mm -hmm. homelessness is a very fluid recurring mm -hmm. um un almost uncontrollable social situation i mean it's interesting that people people find that metaphor of the mm -hmm. eradication mm -hmm. of the measles, uh, mm -hmm. of the smallpox vac uh, and the vaccine as the, the, the most inspiring model for mm -hmm. finding a solution to homelessness. 
Well, let me walk you through it because okay. it really is fascinating. Okay. Um, the, the, the key insight here, and I think the fact that this model is working sort of validates it, is that what if homelessness is not an individual problem? What if it's a systems problem mm -hmm. and you can change the system? What if it, it? What if a lot of it is controllable? And let me let me um, share the parallel that may be also it also derived in terms of its design uh, from the smallpox eradication, mm -hmm. you know, kind of insights, which is Vision Zero, which is this global effort um, that has to be adopted by cities uh, uh, to uh, end traffic fatalities and 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 uh, serious injuries. And the, it, it originated in Sweden out of this doctor's sense of, hmm, zero is like the international standard for like, you know, like perfect safety and prevention of harm. I mean, like engineers running nuclear power plants and, you know, people in, in, in you know, uh, uh, air, air traffic control towers, their mission is zero too. And like that everybody who is thinking in zero terms is like, how do we design what we do so that you know people who are vulnerable are are protected how do we you know back to traffic okay. we design our roads differently we design our cars differently we have uh you know a uh, uh, different yeah uh, uh, uh kinds of of behavioral prompts and that's the those are the those are the takeaways uh it's not you know smallpox was yeah there was a vaccine but the thing to think about Anwar is if it was as simple as having a vaccine it should have been over and done with in the 1700s you know it took until 1980 to figure out the delivery system like that mm -hmm. it's not enough to have like the answer it's the human ecosystem to put it all together that we can learn from and that's what the smallpox eradication campaign was about figuring out the human ecosystem to, uh, to tame a complex problem. And I cannot resist uh, uh, not saying that the one ecosystem that has not been mentioned today is the kind of economic system we have and that mm -hmm. produces all these disparities yeah. and this yeah. kind of extremes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, I, 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 I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Yeah, looking at that system, and um, mm -hmm. and the other factor is also thinking. You know, Portland is a coastal city. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a lot of climate refugees as well. Um, so, and how will that factor in? You know, what is our housing? How is our housing system? evolving. I mean, if you look at ecosystems, they have cycles, you know, there's never an end game. So I think yeah. it, I, I'm actually in a weird way with Anwar on this because zero means that mm -hmm. there's an end game gain. Mm -hmm. um, but an ecosystem or any kind of system really does ebb and flow and cycle yeah. through and repeat itself and then come back around. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, how do you design a system to handle the housing crisis now, which is very different from when mm -hmm. we first spoke. Mm -hmm. We also have no idea what the housing crisis will be in 10 months when rent um, mm -hmm. forbearance will actually expire. So mm -hmm. I think we'll see an, a larger increase of people that are, homes are threatened. I think 2021 is actually going to be a much harder year mm -hmm. to, you know, to, so to have this conversation mm -hmm. in a year uh, would also be yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm thinking of, yeah. you know, even in mm. ecology, you know, mm. you look to a meadow growing into a forest and you mm. assume the forest is its final endpoint, mm. but eventually there's a forest fire and it goes back mm. to being a meadow. So how, yeah. in housing. Well, actually, yeah, Let me, I, I should, yeah, we're not actually disagreeing, but I think I, I probably need to give a, a deeper um, definition of zero. I mentioned that chronic homelessness it should be an absolute zero. That's something, you know, the definition of chronic homelessness is that you've been homeless for a year or more and have a disability. Like no one should be undetected and struggling and suffering that, that long. But veteran homelessness is representative of, you know, the definition there for zero homelessness is the, the operative definition of zero that we're talking mm -hmm. about, which is you have a system that is built to stay ahead of the problem, to basically, mm -hmm you know, identify and contain and to basically constantly
constantly adapt so you're staying ahead of the problem. And uh, the, the skills that we find communities need, you know, are, 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 are basically problem solving skills, adaptation skills supported by policies that can adapt quickly as the problem moves and changes. Um, I don't know what the, the case is in Portland, but there are parts of New York City that haven't been rezoned since the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, and, 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 you know, it's just like, we need much more dynamic policies to keep pace with this, um, this vision of like, uh, uh, like what a housing system should be producing. And, and not that, you know, like zero is, is it, zero is, I think, as you're imagining in kind of a living ecosystem. It's you're staying ahead of the problem. Science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with those clarifying words, thank you so much. <laughs>